<clears throat> and if everyone could turn their microphones off, that would be great. Unless I'm just pronouncing something terribly wrong, then you can interrupt me. Well, thank you all for joining me today. Um, before I get started, I'd like to share why I put this presentation together. <clears throat> there are moments in your life when you go out on a limb, you reach a little farther than you think you can, and you are rewarded for it. And that, for me, is what today is all about. I'm relatively new to architecture. I was compelled to start my studies at University of Idaho when the pandemic dissolved my career in the wine industry. It had been 14 years since I finished my BFA and I tested three different careers in the meantime. That summer I spent days and weeks really just sitting on my deck while on furlough, <clears throat> contemplating how I could contribute to this broken world. Architecture was and is my leap of faith. Six months later, an architect friend of mine died unexpectedly. I used to be his barista when I was in art school. Um, we would discuss things like proportion, light and shadow over espresso after the morning rush. <clears throat> over the 2020 holidays, I was on the fence about applying to the T-Space residency. I was exhausted um, and my portfolio was a mess, but the next week Ed's passing spurred me to put the effort in. I submitted within minutes of the deadline, of course, but a week or two later, I got the acceptance offer and I couldn't believe it. And everything since has been transformative. With the support and opportunity provided by my professor and research supervisor, Carolina Manrique, I put this presentation together. I'd like to dedicate this effort to my friends, Ed and Elizabeth, but this is for all of you. Students, friends, and family, whatever your situation. If you are uncertain, take a chance. So here we go. This past summer, I was fortunate to have been awarded a fellowship at T-Space Rhinebeck, a multidisciplinary arts organization outside Rhinebeck, New York, part of the Stephen, Hall Myron, Stephen Myron Hall Foundation. <clears throat> T-Space Rhinebeck is on the grounds of Stephen Hall's property near Round Lake in the Hudson Valley and comprises a collection of sculpture and experimental buildings dispersed throughout the woods. <clears throat> the original T-Space Gallery is an art gallery. <clears throat> it draws its name from its plan. The gallery hosts exhibitions, poetry readings, musical performances, and lectures throughout the year. T2 is the studio and pinup space for residents. The exit in-house is a temporary residence for artists. Also on the property is the new archive building for Stephen Hall Architects, housing the firm's architectural models and Stephen's personal studio and library. This is adjacent to his family home he calls Little Tesseract. The buildings and the sculpture are all informally connected by trails, organized for a sequential experience of discovery. The T-Space Architecture Residency is a 25-day intensive design studio aimed at achieving a synthesis of the arts and architecture, guided by Stephen Hall, and organized by T-Space Director of Education, Irene Sarelia. Due to the conditions of the ongoing pandemic, my residency was a virtual one, along with five other architecture students. Brian Hartman from Los Angeles, California, is in his third year at Carnegie Mellon University in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Yolanda Wen, born in New Zealand, raised in Shenzhen, China, now studies architecture and philosophy at Cornell University. Jack with you graduated with a physics degree from Georgetown in 2020 and is pursuing a master's in architecture at Harvard GSD. Alexander Kern is from Switzerland and had just graduated with his Bachelor of Arts in Architecture from Rhode Island School of Design. Megan Pisarczyk grew up in rural Pennsylvania and is in her fourth year, also at Carnegie Mellon University. I was born and raised in central Washington state have a Bachelor of Fine Arts from Walla Walla University and I'm pursuing a master's in architecture 
at the University of Idaho. We were aided by our resident host, Maxwell Funk, a former intern at Stephen Hall Architects and a master's student at Laurentian University McEwen in Sudbury, Ontario. That describes a fairly diverse cast of characters so far. Diversity was found in the programming as well. Each day of our schedule took us on either a virtual tour of museums, galleries, architecture, and sculpture parks, or participating as lecture panelists for experts from several disciplines within architecture. The lectures were all made, are all made available to you at the T-Space uh, YouTube channel, by the way, and they're all really good. A few weeks before the residency began, Maxwell sent us a short essay Stephen had written called Reset, Architecture of Air, Light, and Green Space. It's a manifesto, really, a considered response to the state of humanity, followed by a summary of 10 points that he believes are inevitable changes in our future. <clears throat> it starts with the George Kubler quote, actuality is the inner chronic pause where nothing is happening. It is the void between events, suggesting the pandemic is humanity's opportunity for pause. Concluding this existential plea, Stephen writes, a reset of human behavior requires a reset of human consciousness. If you fast forward a few weeks to our first day of virtual residency, Irene conducted introductions and a short review of the schedule, but then gave us a preview of our design brief entitled Transformation of Consciousness. We were all a little speechless at first, at least I was. I was trying to wrap my head around what this could mean architecturally but Irene was prepared for the silence and reminded us of Stephen's essay. She shared selected writings with us to read in the next few days. There are three essays on consciousness. Stream of Consciousness, a groundbreaking work of psychology by William James written over a century ago, outlines the characteristics of consciousness while acknowledging the limitations of empirical science. Next, the preface from Onflow, Dynamics of Consciousness and Experience a recent work by Ralph Jason Pred. This brief introduction to his work is calling for renewed effort to consider the relationship of perceived experience to the distorting variables of language and culture and how that shapes our consciousness. Lastly, Self of Sense by neuroscientist Leah Kelly. She suggests that the epiphenomena we attribute solely to the brain, like perception, memory, and interpretation, occur in all cells. Her proposal states that we're not merely a reflection of brain activity, but is the ongoing product of states that are continually in flux, in which numerous interconnected dynamic relationships exist at all scales across all systems, not limited to a particular location. Her argument really resonated with me. This was the first link to my past in the field of fine art I've had since starting my architectural studies. My undergraduate work culminated in a body of paintings surreal portraits exploring identity and familiarity through faces whose most recognizable features have been reduced and distorted. It was a response to the work of Carl Jung's theories on the collective unconscious. These readings on consciousness for T-space, particularly the physiological context of Leah's essay, gave me a lot to consider. And it was nearly overwhelming, but I loved it. <clears throat> One Final component of Irene's introduction was an assignment to screen the 1962 experimental film La Jete by Chris Marker. We were to watch it together that night. She informed us of our final presentation format, a five minute film. La Jete would give us some idea of the poetic potential of conveying an emotional and spatial experience with still images and sound in the film format. I believe this introduction to the next few days of our summer was a few weeks of our summer was uh, carefully curated. We had not met Stephen or been offered the details of the brief, but we were suddenly immersed in disciplines outside of architecture, psychology, neuroscience, existential philosophy, and storytelling through film. This multidisciplinary curiosity I've come to realize is Stephen Hall's modus operandi. Before we had a chance to dream up architectural conventions for a design, we were plunged into a wider world of thought. 
This would cost us precious time wading through dense unfamiliar concepts and grasping for a link back to architecture, but our work was so much deeper for it. I realize in retrospect that each of the lectures were selected for a unique and sometimes very oblique approach to considering consciousness. Photographer Iwan Bond presented us with a record of vernacular, informal, and repurposed architecture from his travels. His series of images from a cemetery north of Manila, which has monuments referencing the full range of architectural history, ancient Egypt to the modernists, is now occupied by locals living and sleeping and socializing in the crypts and on the capstones of burial plots, illustrating the unpredictable nature of human habitation. Tom Main's lecture was an insight into his design process. Beginning with a form of automatic drawing, followed by a methodical analysis of the resulting work, the juxtaposition of an unthinking creative act a pure stream of consciousness followed by a critical investigation results in a deep understanding of his own internal graphic language, intuition, and formal instincts. Kina Lesky's lecture entitled Field in part explores the relationship of intention and attention. She shared her own thesis project from the Cooper Union, a black resin funnel that a ball, is, it, ball bearing is slid into which revolves down faster and tighter as might be expected according to the laws of physics. But the observation of this action, the sounds, the reflection of neighboring lights off the polished metal, the increasing speed, all forms of feeling. Her professor, John Haydick, at the time said, you must pursue this the rest of your life. It has led to many explorations of the creative process. This is from her book, Storm of Creativity. Her most recent work that she shared with us is an animated drawing. It's presented in reverse time lapse as she constructs a field of clover. The movements across the field are apparent in condensed time, but are actually recordings of her intuitively shifting focus around the field as she constructs layer by layer. It's like a sequential map of her intuition. We uh, took a virtual tour of Dia Art Foundation's Beacon Gallery, which introduced us to work that is so reduced in representation as to heighten the role of space that it's exhibited in. For example, Andy Warhol's Shadows is a series of 102 canvases. The quantity displayed is determined by the length of the walls in any, any chosen room. And this leaves the curator significant control over the arrangement and selection, which shapes a different experience with each exhibition. Architect Yolande Daniels shared her project, Black City, the Los Angeles edition, recently exhibited at MoMA. Her work is an investigation of segregation and integration of the Black community in the city since it was originally founded by the Spanish. She uncovers narratives of the inhabitants, their agency, and how they built community focusing on their power to shape the spaces around them. And she tells that story through an analytically derived form. Bea Kelly shared research on perception within the field of neuroscience, tracking the physiological response to sensory data and linking brain science to phenomenology. The theme of consciousness and architecture throughout all of this programming, <clears throat> all organized for the sake of a half dozen students is even more powerful now reviewing my memories. We were exposed to all of this work, these ideas, forms of critical thinking, design process, not before conceiving our design ideas in the studio, but simultaneously. And I believe more in preparation for our work beyond the residency. Now T-Space is uh, intended of course as a design studio. My excitement for this opportunity drove me to pursue a deeper understanding of Stephen Hall's work in the months before the residency. Through his books and a handful of videos online, I explored his process, inspirations, and theories of perception in parallax, anchoring, and of color and light. Additionally, I'd done a case study on his Stretto house with some friends spring semester. 
All of this was still relatively fresh by the time our studio began, but I had every intention of tackling my design in the Stephen Hall fashion, even if I hardly knew what that was. Now I'm gonna take you through my early design development chronologically, hoping that I can communicate how we were guided to connect architecture to consciousness. At our first meeting with Stephen, he asked each of us individually what our creative interests were. Brian is a cellist and a welder. Megan is a glass artist. I has shared my background of painting and fascination with materials. It's funny to realize how close those few sentences he teased out of us manifested in our work to come. Perhaps it's an, an affirmation from a person we all revered, but despite a variety of detours, we all followed a vein that aligned with that quick exercise of self-analysis. However, it wasn't easy to find a concept generator that aligned with designing for transformation of consciousness. It's a big thing to wrap your head around. Our brief was relatively simple in requirements, thankfully. It was to be a pavilion, an educational facility sited near Montgomery Place in the Hudson River. 6,000 square feet, office space for a staff of eight, a classroom, and an event space. Beyond that, it was up to us. Stephen downplayed the program almost immediately, casually quoting Louis Kahn with a chuckle. Program is just so many bananas. He seemed urgent to return us to the real challenge of understanding consciousness, to find a thread and follow it until we found our architectural language. I started my project entirely in the abstract with mathematics. I had recently discovered Ryman's hypothesis of predicting prime numbers on the complex number plane. Plotting prime formulas results in a beautiful geometry, an eternal series of loops all passing through a single point. Like consciousness, primes are singular, cannot be transferred yet share a common anchor. I started with a series of watercolor and pencil sketches attempting to tease out a third dimension from this geometry. <clears throat> During my first work critique with Irene, she pushed me to get inside of it to explore the interior space and to build study models. A couple days later, I had a small clay massing model, a section and daylighting drawing, and a few paper study light models. She said that the massing model was already suggesting a building and that I should put my efforts into exploring the interior spaces. So I tried more of the loop studies, but in perspective. In some, the loops became planes rotating on, rotating on axes, <clears throat> axes, their intersections defining space. For others, I took the loops on the two-dimensional axis and then redefined the cells created by intersecting by the intersections as massings, but I still wasn't getting inside. Our first pinup with Stephen was on a Monday afternoon, a week into the residency. The morning of, I did some more studies in watercolor, this time zoomed into a set of intersections of looping ribbons. On the same sheet, I drew a large rough perspective, a small elevation and a plan of the same intersection. I presented a short video in, which included some concept diagrams describing Ryman's hypothesis and a selection of my work from the past week. Stephen immediately asked to see one of the studies that morning and he pointed out the specific intersection. I think you've discovered something there. That connection there, I think you could build an entire architectural language from that, see what you can do. And Stephen was like that with everybody. It was almost immediately there was one particular thing that he pointed out that became essentially the seed for our project. <clears throat> Here's some work from my fellow students at the pinup. Yolanda Wen was exploring an arrangement of spaces that appear fragmented on the site, but are connected inside at the sublevel. An interpretation of the consciousness theory of objective observation versus subjective engagement. Brian Hartman was developing work from a welded metal and glass sculpture he had made in school, analyzing the relationship of colored shadows, implying transparency while the structure appears opaque. 
This was intuited in response to a piece of chamber music featuring a cello and piano and some kind of sonic fight. Jack Wathieu was referencing the fields of Levius Woods in his analysis of his own auto drawings. He had carved a soapstone sculpture in a previous class and found the discarded fragments in his front yard. Excavating it inspired a question of the quarry as a metaphor for harvesting experience. Alexander Kern had developed a few themes, a frame shifting with daylight exploring projected surfaces throughout the day, the relationship between rotation and revolution, and the relationship of interior color to diffuse daylight. All of these were themes were an exploration of making the visitor sensually and sensitively aware of place. Stephen called the models on the right a uh, polychromatic livable wall, referencing Louis Baragon. Megan Pisarczyk presented some models of simple wood blocks that she had slumped plexiglass over with a heat gun, an analog for her usual material of glass in lieu of a forge. Her work was exploring the intersection between glass and the objects enacted upon it, as analogous to the characteristic of transitive states of mind. She stated, consciousness feels the closeness or almost arrives at concrete thought. She had cut and colored the edges of the plexiglass, and that led to an impromptu lecture from Stephen on the basic elements of architecture, point, line, plane, and volume. Stephen then touched on each of our projects in that context. Immediately after that pinup, I sketched a simple two-line section and a plan of intersections and began playing with the clay again, this time a denser plasticine sculpture clay. It's a bit stiffer, offers more resistance, and is a rich earthy red color that I like. I thought I need to build these intersections with my hands so I can feel them and see inside. I'm gonna take a, a brief detour from our projects to talk about camaraderie. We agreed on meeting after hours, just the, the residents a few times a week. This day we had a lot to share. We were all excited about students engaging directly with our work. The energy was palpable even across Zoom. We spent about an hour reminiscing and scheming where we wanted to take our projects next. A week prior, we had had a sim similar situation watching La Jete, and that was all raw curiosity. Our brief was still a mystery, but this day we were in the thick of it, making things, discussing them with the master. We couldn't help ourselves drift into the big picture though. Within an hour, we are discussing the architectural profession, the state of the world, how the former seems so out of touch with the latter and how we could change it. We shared a little bit more of ourselves in the process and began to bond. It was frustrating not being present in the same room, of course, but that angst just merged with our dissatisfaction with the status quo. The discussion went something like this. Architecture seems so limited in scope today. There is a generic cheapness to everything from the mundane McMansions to the commercial high rises to the economically derived mess of our cities and building industry. Everyday architecture so rarely has feeling more than surface deep, like an inhabitable magazine ad for the wealthy while everyone else stumble, stumbles around their awkward drywall boxes designed by the real estate market. Harsh maybe, but cynicism aside, the future has to be better. People deserve better spaces to live their lives. I think this is perhaps when we assigned ourselves purpose. Designing to inspire transformation in this exercise and perhaps in our future practices. That night and the next two days, I worked with my hands again. Clay is a medium you can get a lot of emotion into. It's psychologically cathartic. There is such an immediate feedback loop from mind to body to form and back again. The next two lectures were from Yolan Daniels and Martin Stigsgard, both revolving around the agency of historically underprivileged communities. Congruent with the themes of humanitarianism from Costas Corrales lecture the previous week. Martin is a design studio professor at City College in New York, and he has spent over a decade learning from First Nations people in the Americas, more recently with the Tuscarora Nation displaced by the Robert Moses Niagara power plant in the 1960s. Architecture has power and we must wield it with caution, was the subliminal theme. 
A new concept began to emerge in my project at this time. I think working with Clay led me to think of earth and geology. These two lectures now added to those from Costas Corellis and Iwan Bon started to germinate a seed of time and loss or entropy in my work. Irene recommended a handful of essays by Robert Smithson. The next few days I picked up momentum with my modeling. I found spatial relationships in the first model that I then modeled at a larger scale, big enough to film the interiors. I was designing spatially finally, and it felt good. A few days later at mid review, I started to connect some dots. Chris Bart, one of our guest critics, a professor at RISD, gave me some great advice on editing down my ideas, which I desperately needed, but he said something else that flipped the switch for me. Among the too many ideas I presented that day were a handful of drawings of geological road cuts from the Hudson Valley and some photos of rammed earth. Chris suggested that the sedimentation I was showing in these images <clears throat> was demonstrated in the fingerprints and tool marks of my clay models that the medium I was designing with was an, an analog for the geological process. His comments reminded me of James Lavador, my favorite landscape painter. He describes his process working according to the same principles as nature on the landscape, adding layers of paint and then eroding them with turpentine. I recognized then how the primitive appearance of my models at this point was not a limitation of early development, but actually carried more meaning when married with the concept of time. This is a good point to break from my design process and investigate what the residency was accomplishing on a larger, longer scale. We were being instructed through guided process and review, through lectures and tours, and through literature, how to think architecturally, not simply in terms of the built environment, but they were framing the why at every stop of the way. Alberto Campo Beza gave us a lecture entitled About the Need for Beauty. It has to be one of the most genuinely passionate presentations on architecture I have experienced. And it's on YouTube, so you should all watch it. He gave us a tour of his favorite personal projects anchored in stereotomics and tectonics. Elegant, simple, and pure are just a few words to describe his style, but he was offering his work as a precedent to discuss aesthetic beauty and why it is a human need. Tom Means' architecture is a result of investigating his own aesthetic impulses and then organizing them by yet another phase of intuition, selecting and editing until the spaces are built and become something altogether new for each person as they proceed through complex and surreal environments and parallax. We had a lecture from Lead Pencil Studio, who operates somewhere between investigative journalism and concept art. They were the first architects to use LIDAR or light detection and ranging, a remote sensing method that scans an object and plots a three dimensional bitmap. Their scannings of Rome and New York City reveal the unintended architectural world of traffic signals, commercial signage, advertisements, vegetation all of these things that exist parallel to the formal built environment. They estimate that what we see is only about 30% architecture in most cities, questioning the hierarchy of importance we assign to the buildings versus the rest of the environment that we engage with. So our work took on new heated energy after the mid-review. I took a day or two of struggle to refine um, my approach, which for me was shedding a lot of themes to focus solely on time. I knew I had something with the clay, the rammed earth, geology, a deep world time as Stephen called it, but I wanted to marry it with a more ephemeral scale of time that would balance the weight and opaqueness of my clay model. I tried bonding strips of yellow trace together with tacky glue in a paper mache fashion. It started to work as the translucent membrane began to resemble a cocoon, referencing the chrysalis state of transformation and achieving the other scale of time I was looking for. According to Irene and Stephen's instructions, I began to construct 
a film as a procession of the interior spaces. Using video of sun paths and the models, still photography and watercolor renderings, tying together a range of experiences in a sequence. The Friday morning of our last week before final review, we were instructed to write a 150 word abstract describing our project. We met with Ashley Simone, a writer and educator of architecture at Pratt, who is also an editor of architecture books for publishers like Lars Muller and Princeton Press. She met with each of us asking to read our summary first. She then began to ask questions about my project, how the sentence structure, vocabulary, and organization of the narrative communicated my project. I think what Ashley helped me do was to use language to refine my idea, to question what it really was, and in turn that informed the final graphic presentation as well. I'm gonna share a portion of my final video presentation for you now. So I should mention that I thoroughly enjoyed making this video. As it came together, I made a few paintings to fill in the gaps of the story. I recorded the guitar while watching the final edit, an indulgently loud and intuitive exercise I can't wait to do again. <clears throat> so how did the final review go? Often this question is asked with uh, tension, like we're anticipating a slap across the face. If the rumors are true, there is a long history of destructive versus constructive critique in architectural education. That isn't a universal trend in my experience, but I've witnessed it occasion, on occasion. Um, but that 
anxiety and tension was never present at T-Space, not in our pinups with Steven or our daily work critiques with Irene, and not among the dozen or so mid and final reviewers. It was a concerted effort by everyone that spoke to help us better communicate the work we presented, offer a deeper investigation into our spatial design, and explore potential for applying our discoveries to future work. When I arrived at the final review, I was more calm than I probably have ever been at a critique. I don't know if this review culture was coordinated or if it was simply the vibe of the community that Stephen has fostered for the residency, but it had a cumulative effect. I knew I was gonna walk away with more than I came with. There was some specific comments at the final re review that left an impact I wanna share. Stephen said that the translucent membrane was a breakthrough. The materiality of the rammed earth and the membrane sharing a similar palette, one reflecting the light, the other diffusing and refracting it. Christoph Kampusch made several comments on the painterly nature of my spatial designing and wondered how and if this approach would have an impact if I changed materiality, if the site specificity were to change my palette. Kina Lesky commented on how I was thinking through material and that I should invent a new material for the transparent mem membrane. The metamorphosis of consciousness is translated through the membrane as a chrysalis. Christoph added to this saying that we need to invent the material and method to accomplish the architectures that we dream up. EJ Song suggested that my concept requires a new understanding of tectonics, a new method of assembling material, a layering that can achieve transparency and the strength of structure. The next level is how do you do this in reality? So to conclude, I wanna to tie together the different elements of this residency program in the context of what we'll take forward with us. First, I wanna focus on camaraderie. I mentioned the after hour studio meetings we had, and despite the limitations of Zoom, the six of us, I believe, became friends. If there is any criticism of the entire experience, it is the limitation of distance and only socializing on appointment over Zoom. But it also offered opportunities that otherwise would be impossible. After our final review, we had a virtual social hour with uh, former T Space fellows. And it was a small group, but I made another connection with a recent graduate from Taliesin School of Architecture, whose thesis project has contributed to pushing my concept further since. I've also been corresponding with a couple of the lecturers who I'm flattered are here today. And I know all of these relationships will be fruitful in the future in ways that are impossible to predict. Second, the selected readings at the beginning framed our phenomenological experimentations and knowledge outside of architecture before we had any notions of our project. This started a new habit for me. I now regularly seek out literature and research in a variety of fields, simply following my curiosity. This lifted an inhibition to stray from architecture while in school. I don't know where that came from. It just was always there. Our education is intensive and leaves little time for outside musings, but it is incredibly uh, fruitful, this kind of exploration while you're designing. Third, the exposure to experts. Presenting their life work in such a condensed period of time will leave a lasting impression. It will inform how I approach design projects from now on. <clears throat> and my my entire education and professional experience has been centered on the idea that you get out of it what you put into it. I've always given myself personal challenges outside of the requirements, but what T-Space gave me was permission to widen the horizon of that challenge. I started my next studio with a handful of books and ideas that have already uncovered new precedents, philosophies, design processes, and an anchoring in purpose for my work. In summary, I'll return to the imperative that finishes Stephen's reset essay. To change our behavior requires a change in consciousness. The experience at T-Space reframed architecture for me as a celebration of human needs, experience, and perception. We deserve joy, wonder, and meaning every day, and I'm not interested in wasting time on work that does any less. I hope that my analysis of the T-Space pedagogy will help direct your education 
and that here <clears throat> and that my experience inspires you to broaden your field of view. I'm not more special than anyone here. Many of you possess skill and insight that has pushed me to work far harder. So I challenge you to do the same. Try new things, take chances, apply to T-Space and other programs like it, but find a deeper purpose and whatever you come up with will be worth sharing too. Thank you. Um, I'd like to take the opportunity to, to thank everybody um, that participated at T-Space and everybody at University of Idaho um, and all my friends. You, you guys have uh, kind of got me here. So um, let's see if I can see who's online. Anyone want to be introduced? Christoph, are you, uh, are you still with us? Let's see. Hi, Reggie. I'm I'm still here. I'm the least important um, character <laughs> uh, today. I, I just wanted to cheerlead a little bit and uh, send greetings from Ili and Dimitra, of course, uh, Stephen, um, who I screenshot a couple of things uh, for. We are very eager to see the recording. You're in such a great place with such an awesome community, what it what it looks like. And uh, um, it's great to see so many people online celebrating um just like architecture and uh anyway that's it i i like you know it's I, again like nice to see you the work again and 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 some of your great friends family and and and, and professors of course thank you thanks krista <clears throat> really appreciate that um i uh i i want to mention again that i did this project um as part of my my job with carolina and I'm a research assistant working under her this uh, year. And what's great about it is that we used my T-State ex experience essentially as an exercise to learn how to put a presentation together and how to do research. And so that's leading to a number of other presentations that I'm going to be developing this year for the ICMA uh, competition that happens in the spring. So that's kind of maybe the practical reason why we're all here today. Um, thanks to everybody that showed up. Uh, does anyone have any questions? Reggie, I'm just curious about, um, have you had an opportunity of reflecting uh, in your current studio? I mean, you're, you're dealing with a great topic challenge, right? So how, how is this? you know, yeah, transferring into that experience. Definitely. You know, it's interesting. We're, we're, uh, what is it like 11 weeks in the studio right now? And my project this semester, my approach to it directly progressed from my T-Space project. Um, and, you know, it, it results very differently uh, in, in the architecture, um, I think, kind of like Christoph was questioning is like, does a new site turn into something new as far as the architecture goes? But I'm still thinking through material um, and I'm considering like what kind of spaces and material experiences uh, kind of imbue as a consideration of time and uh, our place on the planet. So, yeah, um, it's been a lot of fun. It's uh, it's a lot more work <laughs> to uh, to basically jump into a, any kind of project with this like this base layer this deep. Like you you jump into it uh, with a consideration of like psychology and philosophy and just your own personal interests in it it's like really fruitful. Um, still working on trying to edit down my ideas. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's going really well. And um, thanks to my professor, Samantha, who is here. And uh, I don't know if I can embarrass her at all, but she's been really supportive along the way. Um, 
And uh, actually, I see Leah Kelly's here as well. Um, thanks, Leah, for your support while putting this uh, presentation together. Um, Leah's uh, done a number of uh, presentations that you can find online. Her, her particular lecture was, was a private one. It's not on YouTube. But uh, I encourage everybody to go explore neuroscience um, as an architect. <laughs> Any other questions before we finish, finish up? I know many of you have to get back to studio class soon. So. No? OK, well, thanks so much for showing up, everybody. I really appreciate it. Um, I recorded this, so I'll make it uh, available for people that couldn't show up or catch all of it to uh, watch it later. So thanks again. Thanks, Reggie. Thank you. Everyone have a wonderful Thanksgiving break. <laughs>